Well, uh, good evening and welcome to this uh, very special Tortoise Thinking. Uh, my name is Matt Denker, I'm an editor at Tortoise. I'm delighted that you've all joined us for this very special occasion, uh, which is a conversation with um, one of the truly great broadcasters in the country, James O'Brien, whom I'm sure you've all um, heard as um, a, a seasoned host, a very popular host at LBC, but also a, a brilliant writer in TLS and elsewhere and a best-selling author of a, uh, his first book, How to Be Right. Um, and the inspiration for tonight's conversation is, is partly his new book out, which I can't recommend um, highly enough. It's called How Not to Be Wrong. Uh, here it is, and I'm sure we'll uh, post the details of the book in the chat. So if you're interested in getting hold of a copy, you can. I, I, I recommend it. it. The title, How not to be wrong may sound like a reformulation of the first book's title, um, but it isn't, um, as we'll go on to see, it's anything but. It's a very different and, 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 and intriguingly different kind of book. Um, the, there are various ways today of contributing, and the key, of course, as always with us thinking, is to hear your contributions, your questions for James. Um, we'll have a bit of a discussion, and I'd, I'd love everyone to pitch in um, uh, as they can, either in the chat box or if they want to uh, be brought in straight away, just raise it, your hand. If you click on the participants button, you'll see a raise hand key. Uh, that enables me to see that you want to speak. And I'll come to you as, uh, uh, as soon as I can and to as many of you as I can because I imagine there are very many of you who want to discuss with James his ideas, his thoughts, his propositions. Uh, so first of all, Jane, welcome and thank you for uh, coming to talk to us. Um, the book kind of has as its governing principle, um, one of the lines that appears to towards the end is there's no point in having a mind if you never change it, um, which is a, a strong and, you know, interesting concept and, and requires some unpacking, I guess. Um, what's really interesting is that the the way you get there, the journey you take us on is a very personal one. Mm. Uh, you know, you, it's, it's, there's plenty of rigorous arguments in the book, as, as one would expect. Um, but the route to the proposition and all of the things that you discuss around that proposition um, is actually not quite a, basically not quite an epiphany, but certainly a pretty hard won voyage of personal discovery. Can you can you talk a little bit about how that happened to you? Yes, of course. I, I, it comes comes close to epiphany, actually. I, I, I think at times, I um, I, I, I kind of had a, a, something terrible happened in, in in our family. One of the people I love most in the world got very very ill about four years ago, and I approached it as I've approached every other challenge in my life with, with, with a mixture of, you know, uh, ebullience, belligerence, charm. I I, I kind of always argued my way out of any problem and argued my way to any success that, that I've ever had. And, and without realizing it, I, I, I sought to deal with illness in, in exactly the same way. And, and it not only failed, obviously, you can't uh, cajole. You can't argue, you can't, can't argue with an illness, can you? You can't, you can't debate someone better. And, um, no. and, and actually my inability to the fact that I had nothing else in my toolbox, Matt, is probably the best way of putting it, much to my own surprise. I mean, you know, anyone even vaguely familiar with my work will, will know that I've, I've never exactly had a low opinion of myself, but it, but it turned out that my, uh, my toolbox was, was, was empty when, when it came to what I needed to, to help in this particular crisis. And it was suggested to me that, that therapy, psychotherapy might help. And, and I have to tell you, and you'll know, that I, I possibly overstressed this in the book, but I couldn't have been a more cynical or a more skeptical um, uh, person when it came to, to psychotherapy. In newsrooms, as you will know, we, we, we talk about trick cyclists and, and it's the idea of the quick phone call that you put in to get somebody with, with a few letters after their name to, to explain why a terrorist or a serial killer might have, have done what they've done and, and whether they got a bang on their head when they were in kindergarten or... Uh, or, or their mothers didn't love them enough. And, and Trick Cyclist displays the kind of cynicism that uh, newspaper people in particular and, and latterly, obviously, broadcasters employ with this sort of thing. So I went along 
in desperation rather than expectation. If I had been told that a coffee enema might have helped me help my family more, I probably would have tried that, to be honest with you. But, um, but thankfully, nobody did suggest that. And it was psychotherapy that was uh, on, on the agenda. So I went along, uh, as I say, expecting to either find the experience hilarious and get some material for my radio show or to be kind of irritated or enraged, enraged by the whole thing. And, and within two sessions, I, I did have it. Actually, I did have an epiphany. I know it's a slightly um, highfalutin word, but with, within two sessions, I realized that an awful lot of what I thought was me, what I thought was skin and bone and sinew was actually armor, was, that, was actually defense mechanisms that I had manufactured from a very, very early age. And, and most obviously, it emerged, much to my shock and, and yeah, a degree of horror. Um, corporal punishment, getting regularly and, and fairly viciously beaten by my headmaster at my prep school from about the age of 10 onwards. And the effort that I had put into persuading myself that it didn't hurt, that it hadn't done me any harm, that, that actually it was a badge of honor, had leached into every subsequent decade of my life and, 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 and created this person who thought he could, thought he could argue and uh, reason his way out of, out of illness, out of, out of crisis. And, and, and it's fair to say um, that that was quite a revelation. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting, this, this whole idea you discussed throughout the book of the survival personality mm. and one classic, very English type of survival personality is the one that's created by um, an education at the fee paying private school. Um, yeah. You're taught to man up, to um, have a slip up a lip, to cope, yes. uh, to suppress weakness, and all, that, all those sorts of things. And I think what's interesting about your approach to that is that, that, that it's not a new point that there's been kind of character type emerging from public schools uh, for literally centuries mm. what's interesting is that you you acknowledge that up to a point and i stress up to a point it works oh yes yes not well not only does it work in the context of of of, of our own lives and and careers so to speak but of course i think i don't think it's glib to suggest that the the model was created to provide men that would run the empire and it, it, and you couldn't have run the empire um without having turned off some of your capacity for empathy you simply couldn't have done you could or, or certainly you know the, the 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 stiff upper lip segues fairly quickly into a sort of superiority complex or exceptionalism and there's no earthly way that somebody in my case from from worcestershire or, or, or could have ended up in, on the subcontinent, essentially acting as a, as a, a sort of form of, of ruler. And, and it, it meant that not only did you have to subsume compassion and empathy, but you also had to convince yourself that these privations were, were strengths. But you're absolutely right. It works a treat. It, I mean, it works a dream. The road to Damascus moment, I don't know if my publisher will thank me for saying this, but I, I was struggling in the early days of writing it because we, we had a kind of mixed vision of what the book was going to do. There was a temptation to write, especially given what's happened with, with Donald Trump, Brexit and Boris Johnson. There was a temptation to write a book called I Told You So or... And you were right. Yeah, yeah, or How to Be Writer. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I don't, I don't think anyone would have thanked me for that. And so we came up with this idea of writing about me being wrong, but also other people being wrong. And it wasn't quite landing. And then David Cameron, after Boris Johnson contracted coronavirus. David Cameron came out and of course they both went to eat and I went to a, a school called Ampleforth which is widely sort of viewed as the Catholic equivalent or the Catholic version although it's nowhere near uh, I don't think we've had any prime ministers for, from our school so it's, it's not an entirely helpful comparison but Johnson contracted coronavirus and Cameron came out in good faith and well-meaning it's important to bear that in mind and said well I, I know he'll be absolutely fine because I've seen him play tennis and I just had it. I just, I mean, I think a week had passed between me getting back out of bed after a relatively mild dose. But, you know, in the context of the news that we were both reading and reporting, it was, it was, a, it was a dose. It was a proper dose. I've, I've had the test and the, I've got, I had the antibodies. And, and, and it broke my heart to hear that. It really scared me. I, I, I don't think 
that there are many harsher critics of Boris Johnson as as both politician and and person, but nobody wants him to die. And and having had a little dose of it, and having recognised, as I think most people have, that the only way you 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 don't fight it like you fight a tennis opponent or a debating partner, you you lie flat on your back for as long as you can. You do as little as is humanly possible. You direct all psychic and physical energy that you possess in, into um, into surviving, not 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 yeah. in fighting. And and I, I, I had a little as is my want, a little sort of conflagration on Twitter when I suggested that men like us haven't got the ability to, 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 to lie down, stay calm, look after ourselves and hope and wait for tragedy or danger to wash over us. We have to get out there and, and you know, we have to get off, in, in my case, verbal fists, in Cameron's case, a bloody tennis racket. And, and I really worried that if, if that was the only advice he was receiving, it would end horribly and, and then of course it, it, it did escalate and the more I thought about it the more I realized that it was a consequence of the stiff upper lip the schooling the it didn't do me any harm and that the one thing I was worried about once the book began to take shape was that it would seem as if that was the only constituency I was addressing that this is a, a these are observations that are only going to resonate with people who know their way around enemies of promise by Cyril Connolly and went to uh, boarding schools and it, 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 it became clear really quickly as I thought back over calls I've taken to the program from, for example, people who got caught up in gang culture, or I, I spoke at length to, to George the Poet who writes beautifully about the, the damage that is done at a very, very early age and how it does actually define the, the path that the man takes. And the mistake we make is thinking that it actually defines the man. It, it doesn't. So... I found it since it was released a week ago. The one, the biggest relief has been that people just get that. People are not, but no one so far thinks that it's a book about public schools. It's a book about trauma, trauma and pain and suffering in childhood that turns you into something that you don't have to be. It turns you into someone inauthentic. And when you look at Boris Johnson, and I say this with a modicum of sympathy, you see someone psychologically incapable of admitting that he's wrong. He has never made a mistake. Everything is about winging it. Everything is about um, blagging it. Everything is about uh, never explain, never apologize. I've always found that an utterly witless uh, yeah. aphorism, but it, he lives by it. And it's fine, as you say, you can end up prime minister. You can end up editor of The Spectator. You can end up on a quarter of a million pounds a year for writing a, a relatively pedestrian column in The Daily Telegraph. These are skills that serve us well. They're amazing skills, for want of a better word, attributes perhaps. But there comes a point, and I, I hope most people don't reach this point because it's a, it's a horrible thing to go through, but there comes a point when you're charged with something, in my case, a family trauma, in his case, a global pandemic, there comes a point where you open your toolbox and you realise that the, the sort of curious combination of bloviation and bullshit that has got you to where you've got in life is absolutely no use at all, except I realised it and I don't think he does, or at least I he think, think denies it. What, what's so interesting as well is that you've got that character type, which as you say is in a way uh, confined to one socioeconomic group. Yeah. It's a, it, it's a, it's a it's a psychological position that all sorts of people find themselves in. But there's also a cultural moment, I think, that we're in where, and you say, you say very, again, very, you know, uh, um, you, 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 you reduce it to a very good line, which is open-mindedness is derided as weakness. Yes. And you're in a situation where um, cult, we have a culture that's wedded to certainty. So you know, the, the, the example I always find extraordinary is that when Obama's um, birthplace was being brought into question famously mm. by, by Donald Trump, um, the more evidence he produced, Obama, that he had been born on American soil, the more people believed he hadn't. So in other words, they, the polls showed that, that not only were people not impressed by the evidence, but the more evidence that was presented, the more they retreated into their dug down and doubled down into their position. And I'm, I'm interested in why you think that right now it's so acute, this um, clinging to certainty. I mean, is it because there is, so, there is, we live in volatile times, trust in institutions is crumbling, 
and people need some sort of order and find it in opinion and ideas and convictions and in some cases in prejudices. I, I, there's a lot to unpack there. I, in the first instance, I think that responding to lies validates the lies. I, 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 the, the example you give is, is close to perfect for anybody. Um, in, in, in even sort of with one toe in public life, we'll, we'll, we'll recognise that if someone lies about you or, or, or completely misrepresents you, the temptation to respond is is great. But e almost every response actually inflates the lie. It's, it's well, we wouldn't bother replying to that unless it bothered him, and if it bothers him, it must. No smoke without fire. So I don't know whether Obama would go down that path again if if he if he had his had his time again. I mean, we both say certainty, but it's not certainty, is it? Because as soon as you ask this people, and this is what my last book focused on, as soon as you ask these people to describe the foundation stones of their certainty, not, not only do they fall apart like a cheap suit, but they generally end up getting very angry with the person that's pointed out that their foundation stones are built of sand, that they use phrases like political correctness or, or, or make America great again or Brexit means Brexit and as soon as you ask them what they mean and these days woke or cancel culture 99% um, of people who deploy these phrases can't actually tell you what they mean by them so it's the weirdest kind of certainty it's like uh, um, I, I mean I compare it to football a lot I think I've invented the word footballification although now I've said no, that you. in the public space someone else will claim ownership of that word but it, it, it seems to me and as a phone-in host obviously I'm, I'm very exposed to this we stopped I would say in 2016 for obvious reasons but it probably goes back further than that and probably goes deeper but we stopped judging actions by the actions we stopped judging behavior by the content and we judged it solely by the perceived tribal loyalties of the protagonist so so it's as if you you see something happen on the pitch in this case politics and instead of objectively judging what's happened, for example, you know, Trump is, is obviously going to be the absolute paragon of this. It, it, you're talking about ingesting disinfectant or lying about Barack Obama's birth. It, 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 you look down and you, you see the color of your scarf and you think I am loyal to Trump, therefore I believe this, even though all of the evidence. And I don't know about you, but I used to quote Orwell with a slight sense of, I don't know, a, 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 a slight sense of embarrassment. It always seemed too easy and too pat to, to quote Orwell. But in the last couple of years, if you look at some of the lines in both, actually Animal Farm, which I quote in the book, but 1984, which I reference a lot on the radio show, that the party told you to ignore the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was yes. their final most terrible command. And, and fast forward to 2019, and Donald Trump is on national television in America saying to people, don't believe what you see and hear, believe what I tell you. And, and that only works if you have an attitude to politics that's psychologically identical. And we've all seen it on Match of the Day. You don't have to be turning up um, uh, to watch football live every week. You can see it particularly around the corner flags. It doesn't matter what has happened. All that matters is the colour of the shirt that you're wearing. And if, if, if your man does X, you will swear until your dying breath that he's done absolutely nothing wrong and if if the opposition's man does exactly the same x you will swear until your dying breath that he deserves to be lynched from the nearest lamppost and and i think that crept into politics i think that crept into british and american politics when we kind of took the lid off ancient hatreds for, for whatever reason um we, we kind of stopped insisting particularly with reference to immigration, we, we kind of stopped trying to recognize the humanity of every statistic in immigration conversations and, and fell instead, coupled with, of course, Islamist terrorism, which, and then added to that, that the economic crisis of 2008, these are the circumstances that always leave the, the, the road clear for demagogues and, and authoritarians, and, and I mean, to give them a more accurate title, racist liars. And it just, for me, infiltrated the mainstream because journalists, who'd sort of grown up on John Major and Tony Blair just didn't have, and still don't, don't we, I'm guilty of this, we don't have the um, capacity really to, to deal with blatant lies and blatant untruths and, 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 and blatant bigotry and looking at what could happen in America next week, we still don't. I think what, one of the, um, the, the best chapters in the book is your, your very personal account of your um, sort of apprehension and um, 
relationship concept of white privilege. And it's a very interesting one, this, because at one level, it's just common sense and empiricism. You know, clearly, if you're uh, a white person, you have a degree of advantage that people of color don't. Um, I mean, there are, it, it, there are so many statistics to prove that, so much lived experience to prove that, that it's surprising that there is so much resistance to it on one level. But you interrogate it very cleverly, I think, to, to show why it, it, it triggers in people, uh, um, a, a, a white people that is, a, a sense of defensiveness. Yes. Um, and I'm, I'm interested to hear more about you, you know, how, that, how that you went through that process over a period of time. Yes, I, and, and it was thanks to, to a caller to my program called Emma, actually, that, that it <clears throat> crystallized for me this year. So there I am patting myself on the back for being, um, as it says on the front of the book, the conscience of liberal Britain. And then I fell into this elephant trap live on the radio about six months ago where um, someone was explaining white privilege to me and I started bridling. And, and the reason I realized when I dug into my own thoughts and feelings, the reason I started bridling was because she, quite rightly, was not just floating the possibility, but al almost certainly expressing the fact that whatever um, wins I've had in my career would have been much, much harder to achieve if, if I hadn't been white. And, and, and it took away from my suffering, Matt. It, 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 suffering's a bit strong. It took away from my struggle, right? Because very, very few people get a golden ticket when they leave school or university and get told, here is the career you dream of, good luck. You know, some people do, but, but I didn't. I, I was selling suits on Regent Street, watching, watching Fleet Street and, and the dream of following my father into journalism disappear over the horizon while I'm measuring the inside legs of bankers. And, and it used to keep me awake at night. And then when I, when I got a foothold in, in the industry, and, and then another foothold and another foothold, I would still worry and I would still fret and I would still have um, concerns about not having achieved enough or not having a high enough status or not having enough, crucially, I think, security. Uh, worry about losing my job. What happens if, if this happens? And, and for me, I took, I took, as I think everybody who's got a problem with the, with the phrase does, although it, it would be helpful if more people perhaps admitted this to themselves, it, 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 it took away my sense of, um, of struggle. As I say, it was as if I felt I was being told, you've only got where you've got because you're white. And that's not what white privilege tells you. All white privilege tells you is that, yes, you struggle, particularly class, which obviously hasn't affected me much, but it's just one area of struggle that being white excuses you from. As well, I, I guess it's, it's two things, isn't it? it it's that um, it forces white people to think about race and whiteness. Yes. Um, and, and not to regard whiteness as so much the default position that it's barely there. And also, as you say, that um, a, a common response to the idea of white privilege is that um, in some way acknowledging the existence of white privilege eradicates any pride you might have in your yes. achievements. Yes, and I think exactly that. That's, exactly that's, that. the, that's the, the hurdle that, yes. that people need help in, in, in clearing, I suspect. And, and I got help from my friend John Amici, who, who, who is a, the, the, the former um, basketball star from Stockport turned uh, a genius communicator and, 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 and psychologist. And he's, he's, he's recorded some things for uh, the BBC that have uh, caught, caught fire. And, and it just clarified things for me. I, actually, to be honest, I've known John for years, but those clips were only released after I'd finished my book, but I just understood it. There were two examples that I give, which I think might help people understand where I'm coming from. The first was when, early on in my career at LBC, when I was constantly waiting to be shown the door, because I wasn't famous, I wasn't well known, I was kind of producing the goods on air, but I wasn't cutting through. I'm, I'm essentially liberal, so I'm never gonna um, uh, garner the attention or the clicks that, that you get if you're performatively obnoxious or, or performatively racist. Um, and I got a pilot. I mean, my TV career going back 10, 10 years has, has got more failed pilots than the 
than the Japanese Air Force, but doomed pilots than the Japanese Air Force. But but this this pilot took off. This pilot was going places, and I mentioned it. I'd not tell you who it was, but it was a, a very famous female um, broadcaster and 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 journalist. And she said affectionately. I realised looking back, she said, "Oh, that's just what we need. Another white male." middle class man on the telly and at the time I was genuinely worried about how I was going to pay my tax bill at the end of the year and I, and I felt very bruised by that but of course she was right they did you know just because it's this male white middle class man doesn't actually dilute the generalization it just hurts when it's me it doesn't hurt when it's um when it's broader and then when I was doing Newsnight the the the, the editor came into the room one day what one of the best journalists I've ever worked with for the record, and and simply said the um, the panel tonight is too too male, pale, and stale. We had three male academics of a certain age on the sofa, and because my background was in show business journalism back in my newspaper days, and then in commercial radio subsequently, and I, I've always managed to keep at least one foot in the deep end of journalism, but I've made my name and my my living mostly in the shallow end. Um, I thought he was joking. I thought that'd be ridiculous. You know, this is an emeritus professor of one thing, and this is a this is a Nobel Prize winning other, and it doesn't matter what colour they are or what gender they are. And as I wrote the book, and before I sat down to write the book, I realised yes, of course it matters because, you know, I am a white middle class man. I feel seen. I turn my television on every single day and see people like me spouting on the telly and I see, um, it, I, even when I see women from a similar background to mine, a similar ethnicity, a similar class, we couldn't be better represented in the media. So the idea that we all have a responsibility to let everybody else in our country, our, 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 our friends, our neighbors, um, and, and people you know that, that we've never met, largely for socioeconomic more than ethnic reasons, they need to be seen as well. So you can call it positive discrimination if you want, but I've always preferred accurate representation and, and the idea that there is ever, you know, to, to the idea that it's ever based solely on qualifications. And the only reason why you only ever see faces like mine on the telly is because by an astonishing genetic and historical coincidence, it turns out they are the most talented and the most intelligent and the most gifted people on the planet at this point in history is obviously utterly, utterly bogus. But when you take it personally, it resonates so differently from how it resonates when you take it publicly or politically. So to say to me, you can't have that job because you're white, which has never actually happened, although there was a, a gig at Channel 4 many moons ago where, where they the message came back saying we love this and we love james but does he come in black and I, again that really upset and hurt me because again at the time my career wasn't where i wanted it to be but i realized as i wrote the book you can't fix this stuff unless it things like that happen happen to people like me so when emma in kensal green uh to give her her on-air title I, I know now that her off-air title is, is is emma ko and she's a um a, a screenwriter of uh, british chinese heritage when she started explaining this stuff to me i felt the old me come out this is all post-therapy remember and the old me fist straight up how dare you suggest are you telling me that uh, if i want to be a a clear-eyed ally of Black Lives Matter, I have to resign my job because I don't get to decide whether it goes to a person of color and it's not up to me who gets it. And I just realized, like, I just thought, Matthew, wind your neck in, mate, for heaven's sake, you're just wrong. It, white privilege is real, black lives do matter. And, and dedicate yourself to, to winning these arguments that still need to be fought instead of nursing decades old grievances about commissioning editors that didn't give you the chat show you thought you were gonna land when you were 29 years old. It's um, it's very interesting because um, I wouldn't want the impression to to be given that the book is a sort of um, sackcloth and ashes. No, 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 I was just thinking that. No, would I? It's full of jokes, it, it, loads of jokes, it, loads of jokes. You know, it it, it really it, it is it is very funny. And it's also there's a very good chapter in it on um, you don't call it this, but it's sort of the merits of hypocrisy, which is that it's really yeah. important to to call yourself out Own on it. positions that you're not going to ditch. But at yeah. least to acknowledge that that you know you're wrong. So the, it, I think it's called tattoos and marriage and private schools. But those, uh, do you want to talk about those for a, a bit? Because it's a very yeah. it's a very interesting sector of your kind of general argument. Well, this takes us back to the point you made about Barack Obama, actually. I think and the um, attempts to discredit people who are mostly 
on the side of the angels. If you can prove one episode, or you can invent one episode that casts aspersions on their credibility. Um, and in Barack Obama's case, they had to go all the way back to his birth and claim that there was something dishonest, something untrustworthy there. In Hillary Clinton's case, it was these emails that, again, nobody who shouts but her emails can actually talk you through the intricacies or the technicalities of what she is supposed to have done. And if they can, they certainly can't explain how it in any way balances out the depravity um, of, of Donald Trump's proven track, track, track record. So it, it occurred to me that while you have forces, for me, forces of, of, of relative evil, trying to discredit anybody who, who, who sticks up, who points out inequality, sticks up for the oppressed, has problems with discrimination, uh, has problems with white supremacism, Islamophobia, prejudice, bigotry, racism, whatever it might be. The, 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 the idea that, that if you can find one thing that proves they have feet of clay, then you somehow undermine the honesty, the accuracy and the validity of all their other positions. Mm -hmm. I thought, how do you counter that? Because you've got two problems. The first problem is if you address the lies directly, as we've as I've explained, my belief is that you actually end up inflating them, as, as you described Barack Obama doing with the so-called Bertha nonsense. Um, if you don't address them at all, they, they, they probably, they don't disappear, but they kind of wither on, the, wither on the vine a bit. But if you actually own your fallibility and you actually say, I know that this is wrong, um, or at least I know that I am being cognitively dissonant. Uh, I, I know, for example, on the chapter about trans issues, I simultaneously hold two conflicting and contradictory positions. They cannot both be right. And yet... The I definition mean, of an artist, according to Scott Fitzgerald. I didn't know the ability, that. The ability to hold two completely competing yes. ideas. I've said I've taken that straight to the bank. That's that, that, one, that, that one's going on the, on the office wall. So how, how do I do that? Well, look at the areas where I know I'm wrong, but I still think I'm right, which yeah. is not, it's, I mean, in the current climate, probably that's a big deal. It wouldn't have been a big deal 10 years ago. It wouldn't have been a big deal when Scott Fitzgerald was writing. Indeed, he turns it into equality. And, and for me, it was just a way of saying, all right, I know private education is, is wrong. I also know that when my dad left school at 15, uh, as the son of, a, of, 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 of the landlady of the roughest pub in Leeds and went to work for the local newspaper as a Catholic lad who didn't have an O-level to his name, the idea of sending his son to Ample Fourth College was like winning the lottery for him. If he could achieve that in his life, that to him would have meant everything. And he did. And it did. And so I know it's unfair, but I know that my dad taught me of all the priorities you have in life, providing your children with the best education you can, whether it involves spending money or moving house to a different catchment area or, or taking a job overseas that involves your, your, your children being educated, is simultaneously contributing to, to the perpetuation of inequality, but also... Um, for me, at least, a, a responsibility of parenthood. Now, I can't. I can't. I, I, mean, I, th I think it's fascinating that, that, that you, you're, you're, you discuss your, with your mum and your dad in lots yeah. of books, your relationship with your, your, your late father. Both, both my parents are dead. And, and something I identified with very powerfully was I find it incredibly difficult to do anything that I would might persuade myself was somehow betraying what they stood for and believed in. Yeah. And, I, and it's an interesting, it's a very interesting, um, it, you know, it comes from a good place, but it's, but it, but it, but it, it feels a bit not, like it, it, it could it's, be restricted. It's a constraint. There's no yeah. question. Yes. I mean, luckily my parents are, aren't, aren't possessed of any particularly controversial, no, no. but, but no, you're right. And, and um, in, in, so, well, actually, in the chapter about corporal punishment, oddly, it was I, I try and work out how on earth I ended up arguing on telly, uh, and not just in, you know, in the pub, but arguing on telly that, that, that beating children is sometimes the only language they understand. Because I grew up in the 1970s, so getting my bottom smacked by my dad was perfectly normal. And then on the radio, I end up 
you know, dismantling or destroying people who ring in to explain why they think you should be allowed to hit your children. And I felt, I think, subconsciously, very deep down, very subconsciously, that this was somehow a betrayal of dad. So I, I understand exactly what you mean. And I, and I pick over the bones of this, this particular example in, in the book. But the, but the chapter you mentioned about marriage and, and, and tattoos and, and private education, that was really good to write. That's the chapter where I allow myself this astonishingly indulgent um, practice of pretending I've rung my own radio show where, where I, you know, there's host me and then there's caller me. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I knew which way the tattoo conversation was going to go. I, I, I have this view that, that um, teachers, I had this view that teachers who've got visible tattoos above the collar or below the cuffs shouldn't be teaching children. And I, I remember I do for a living, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm these days there's over a million people tuning in every week and I'm offending a significant proportion of them. And then a caller came on and said, I'm, I, I, I graduated top of my class as an A&E nurse. I'm covered in tattoos. I've also got a shed load of piercings. If, if your kid, if your daughter was brought into my hospital, would you want me to step back so that a less good nurse without tattoos and without piercings could come and look after her. And that for me was what I like to call, what I call a penny drop moment. It, and it yeah. doesn't, the penny might drop, but it doesn't, it doesn't fix you. And then digging into it, interviewing myself like I would interview a caller to my radio show, turned out something that happened when I was 12 years old on the Estee Lauder counter at Owen Owen in Kidderminster um, had, had given me this deep rooted and irrational terror of, of, of tattoos. But the marriage one was fascinating. Because I, I, I sound like Ian Duncan Smith when I talk about marriage. And, it, and Ian Duncan Smith, for me, is, is one of the most ridiculous and um, damaging politicians that we've had in this country for 20 years. And, and let's be clear, there's a, there's a lot of competition. Yeah, Ian yeah. Duncan Smith, for my money, is very near the front of the field. And yet on this issue of marriage, I would catch myself sounding like him. And I did this on air interview and I, I swear I fully understand that people won't believe this but I swear to you that I did it cold I, I mean I didn't know which way the chapter was going to go when I started writing it and and I started being the you know typing but imagining the radio show where I said so let's talk about why you've got such a problem with marriage and, and digging into me and it, it I, I, I still I don't think I've spoken to mum about this yet although she's got the book so we'll probably have a chat about it at the weekend I was adopted at 28 days old and mum and dad dealt with that in, I think, the perfect way. I, neither my sister nor I have ever had any particular baggage. When I started therapy, it was something my therapist thought would come up a lot and, and, and it just didn't. They just got it right. We just felt loved, we felt wanted um, and we never felt abandoned. And I think that the rationale mum gave us was beautiful because it portrayed my biological mother of having given me to her, to my mum and dad, as an act of love, which in many ways it was, albeit, you know, she was a, a 15 year old uh, Irish girl when she got pregnant. So there wasn't a lot of choice involved in the matter once, once the priests stuck their oar in. But I grew up believing that my biological mother, to whom one, I feel nothing but warmth and gratitude, gave me to my mum and dad because they could give me a life that she couldn't and she wanted me to have that life so far so straightforward how did I end up sounding like Ian Duncan Smith on the question of marriage answer why couldn't she give me that life she wasn't married so something deep inside me saw not being married as being the reason why a parent cannot give their child in this case me the life that they would want to. And that is why they have to give their child, partly because they're not married. And remember as a kid, I didn't know about the, the, the sort of Catholic stranglehold on, on Ireland. I didn't know, uh, I didn't know the age of my, my biological mother. I didn't know any of this. All I knew was that mum and dad could look after me and give me all the love you could possibly dream of. And my biological mother couldn't. And so somewhere deep inside, I had just- Marriage was a secret source. Uh, yeah, as, as a kid, I'd connected on the idea that it's because you're not married. And that's why I used to be vile and obnoxious about people who aren't married. And I'd like to say sorry to all of them because I was being a dick. Um, I'd love to bring in Zach now. I don't know if Zach's there. Um, who had a very, I mean, the, the chat has been absolutely 
jumping alive and I've been struggling, struggling to keep up with it. Um, Zach had uh, what I thought was a really interesting, hi Zach, um, hey, really interesting hi. point, which I'd love to hear from him about um, free debates and the teaching of free debate. Oh yeah, so uh, I was just getting involved in the chat. This is my first thinking to be fair, so. Uh, oh, well <laughs> Okay. One out of one. Um, yeah, it was more of a case. I look back on my school. I went to a comprehensive. I moved school from Wales to uh, Nottingham when I was younger. And just looking back, uh, there was only two teachers who ever really encouraged three, free debate, um, students discussing ideas between each other. And then that followed through in terms of your coursework or, you know, whatever little exams you did internally. Um, and I... Yeah, I made the point that it sort of holds back society later down the line because um, everybody's obsessed with being right. It's kind of, it relates to your book, you know, everybody can't, and I've struggled with this too, but I've recently tried to accept you're not going to know everything. But <laughs> the way we're moving now, generally, you know, with information being so accessible, you can argue, you can argue your point almost to, you know, nobody's going to sit there Googling the correct statistics about global warming when you're in a conversation about somebody. You know, I've had talks with people about veganism and, you know, how I'm not a vegan, but how much we could save, you know, energy wise for cutting down on beef and things. And somebody will reel off a fact or a statistic. You know, I can't then Google it and see whether it's correct or not. That's become, I don't know whether that's come through school, school, the teaching system throughout, you know, the last 10, 15 years. It just seems to be uh impossible to accept that you are wrong sometimes and then learning from that that, that was kind of my point in the chat yes it's, well it, it, it it's because of the shame that's attached to it and and this is i don't think it matters what your background is or, or what kind of school you went to the debating model which is more common in private schools than comprehensive schools rewards you for being able to win arguments even though you don't believe in the in the arguments that you've actually made it is another thing it took me a while to understand i used to love arguing the opposite yeah. of what I believe, because I thought it was a stiffer rhetorical test. But that, what use is that tool in life? I've won an argument with someone I agree with and made him feel stupid and small or made her feel stupid and small because I'm better at arguing, not because I've got better facts. I think, Zach, I could be wrong. I think you're talking more about critical thinking than you are about debating, actually. And, and you look at, I think today it was something like, when you look at Donald Trump's supports, it's 67% of non-college educated white men <clears throat> like him and then the, the numbers flip around the other way when when it's every other category and 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 I'd, I'd lead it back to footballification and this idea the world is really complicated and confusing and and largely not very nice yeah so if someone or something whether it's an individual or an ideology comes along <coughs> and sells you the bogus notion that it's actually really simple your life's rubbish because of immigrants or um, the, uh, the, the, the your life will get better if we leave the European Union. I, I get the seductive nature of, of those, and, and it's the absence of critical thinking and the quality of debate skills employed by people that aren't telling you the truth that, that have led us into much of the much of the current messes. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, isn't it, that we have a kind of adversarial culture in this yes. country rather than an inquisitorial mm. culture, and actually. I, I know that you, you, you've said that you're, you're less combative than you were, but I, I, I sometimes wonder if you exaggerate how combative you were in the sense that your, your broadcasting manner is, is to chase an idea yes. rather than to diminish people, I think. I mean, you, I, I, yeah, I, mean, but I, know I you diminish people, Matthew. You, you, you're kind. Of, I've got this. I won't in, uh, go on too long about this, but there's, there's this weird sort of... Uh, there's me on Twitter, there's me on the radio, and then there's me on the clips... I found out today we've done 60 million clips in the last two years of, of, wow. of me on the radio, which is insane, right? I, I've got to have a look at my bonus um, conditions. <laughs> but there's 60 million <laughs> A lot of people have this tonight. I've never listened to my radio show in their life. So, so all they see is the clips. And in the clips, I often do um, uh, fail to resist the urge to... to to, to sort of dance on the grave of whoever it is that, that I've been arguing with. So yeah, if you can't, if you listen to the show, you come away with a, with a very different view. And I was, I, I would go too far. I, I don't think I ever I very rarely bullied people, but you don't need to um, humiliate people to win the argument. And, and if you do humiliate them, they're less likely to come around to your way of thinking 
than, than they were before. So it's not so much moving forward about being less combative. Um, I, I, I'm not going to stop arguing. I'm not going to stop yeah. pointing out facts. But I, I, I think I'm trying to, as Zach's just nailed perfectly, I'm trying to step away from the thrill of winning regardless of the facts yeah. and evidence. Eleanor Bergen, uh, I don't know if you're there, Eleanor, um, had, um, if you, we can get to Eleanor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. You had a, actually you had a, hi, you had a string of interesting comments, um, <laughs> starting off with one on uh, cancel culture, but I'll leave it to you which, oh, what, uh, okay. what you want to do to James. Um, well, I, hi, um, was just sort of um, talking about my experience of going to a Catholic private school mm. um, in the fact that we did, we had like sort of, um, I wouldn't say that I really sort of had the opportunity to learn about debate and free speech really until I left to go to a state college and also university. And I was just thinking that maybe this is, it sort of like came to me whilst I was writing and replying to people that this is probably one of the reasons why, I know that I hate to be wrong and I always have to be right. <laughs> and I think the, the way that debate is taught and sort of the absence of the way that debate is taught can sort of lead you to think that the point of a debate is always to be right. It's never really to explain and expand on your knowledge and sort of, you know, you're never going to do it to um, change people's minds or educate other people or even educate yourself. It's just purely for winning. And I think that's like sort of something that I've definitely experienced growing up. I think it's, it's, heat, it's heat, not light. And I don't, it's not, it's not, it's not your fault. I think it's our fault, it's Matthew and me, it's just the media creating these ludicrously confected conflicts, turning people like Nigel Farage and, and, and Katie Hopkins into public figures and, and celebrities because they'll turn up on your television programme or your radio programme and cause such an almighty brouhaha that everybody upstairs counting the clicks and the money is, is absolutely over the moon. But everybody, well not everybody, but many of us downstairs counting the facts and assessing the evidence are, are increasingly bereft and increasingly baffled as to as to why these these people are inflated and the answer is that they're, they're good at arguing they're profoundly and dangerously wrong about almost everything but they're very good at arguing they're plausible it's also why to bring it back to class issues it's why people possessed of almost identical views who don't have plummy accents and, and chalk stripe suits are treated like scum by the British media. And yet people coming out with identical things with their, you know, blogs in the spectator or their, um, or their chalk stripe suits are, are treated like sages. So the, the combination of bigotry and class, and then to, to broaden out the issue, it, you, you bring race into it as well. You didn't, but, but for me, it's as if we've started rewarding people for being good at being wrong. And, and, and that's why I think we both feel that the way that we do. And I can't beat them and you can't beat them, but I can own my own wrongness. And if I own my own wrongness uh, or, or acknowledge my own wrongness, especially on deep and personal and difficult issues, then maybe, just maybe, it helps create an environment in which other people's wrongness is recognised rather than rewarded, I think, is, is, is how I'd put it. I um, saw a quote and it said something along the lines of we need to stop thinking that everybody that speaks uh, with a posh accent is immediately right. And I think that's so true. Um, but as like a budding, like an aspiring journalist, it really, really worries me okay. that there's so many people in 24 hour news that what people say doesn't matter. It's sort of who says it. Um, I could say something that could be incredibly true, but just because I'm not sort of somebody that says outlandish things and has a big following or whatever, like Katie Hopkins, like you said, it's not really ever going to be taken sort of seriously. And that really worries me for entering a career in journalism, I think. I, well, you can only be true to yourself. And, and um, I, don't forget that the, the, the woman we both just referred to hasn't got any kind of career at the moment. So you, you, do get, you do get found out at the end. And Farage has just been on stage in America describing Donald Trump as the bravest person he's ever met which makes one wonder quite how he'd feel if he met someone who hadn't dodged the draft five times to avoid the Vietnam War so um I, the accent thing worries me actually Eleanor because that's why dad sent me to public school dad dad had a broad Yorkshire accent and I felt that that, that <laughs> and felt that, that well my, my grandma had the madhouse the market tavern in, in in Leeds which you're far too young 
to, to remember, but that was the kind of pub where you could buy anything, you, you know, whether it was a shotgun or, 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 or a horse, there would be someone in the pub that could sort you out. And, and this is a million miles away from my background and, and my milieu. And, and I, I wish I could say something more. In, well, you look at someone like Chris Mason on the BBC, I think, I think we're probably moving away from the tyranny of um, RP and the tyranny of, of private education, but it did work. You know, after my dad died, I, I spoke to mum about why he'd sent me to this ridiculous school, which for, for the record, you know, bad stuff happened there, but a lot of wonderful, wonderful things happened there as well. And mum just said, cause he, he wanted you to have the golden ticket. And, um, and he, he, he spent some of his career watching people who were less talented and less qualified and, and, and less equipped sort of sidle past him because they had been to schools like mine or they wore waistcoats or, or, or waistcoats or, or they had a pocket watch. And, and that, 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 that is a lot, I, this is no comfort to you, but it's a lot, lot, lot better now than it, than it was then. And, and I can only see it getting better. I, 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 I mean, Jacob Rees-Mogg for me is the most interesting political figure in many ways of the last 10 years, because I cannot understand how anybody can look at him and not laugh. Uh, or, or gnash their teeth in, in fury and anger. So there's still a forelock tugging deferential element, and it obviously helped to drive Brexit. But I, I can't imagine many people under 40 are going to be buying into that nonsense um, for much longer, if, if indeed they are at all. But it's interesting you mentioned that, James, because I think his, I wouldn't say his downfall, but when he collided, he converged with reality when he made the remarks about Grenfell. Mm. Up until that point, it had been a kind of um, a combination of punk rock and PG Woodhouse. Yeah. You know, that, that, that it was, he was sort of um, brazenly not like what you're supposed to be now as a politician, yes. but also spoke like a character from Woodhouse. And, you know, he char famously charmed Jess Phillips and lots of yeah. Labour politicians with the act. But then suddenly it got real. Yes. with the remark on Grenfell. And I think it's interesting that he's been hidden a bit in a box since then. Uh, although he's still revered by, by the, by the capped offers and the forelock targets, of course. Oh, absolutely. That, no, he's that, still that, there. That's been my, I mean, Grenfell for me, actually, just briefly to digress, that for me changed everything. I, I, I presumed up until the Grenfell, long before Jacob Rees-Mogg uttered those despicable words about people dying because they lacked common sense. It was it was it was the response to the tragedy, and and the the glee with which it was greeted, and obviously the inbox and the switchboard of a radio phone-in host is not representative of any constituency other than people who routinely contact radio phone-in shows. But I something broke inside me when I read the responses um, in the immediate aftermath of of Grenfell, the, the the almost performative absence of decency, empathy, compassion. And it was tempting to think that, you know, these are people who are uh, tiny in number and, and irrelevant in impact. And you cling on to that hope up to the point where the leader of the House of Commons comes out and in a slightly more verbose and pompous way echoes the most disgusting messages I've ever seen in my life in the radio studio. And they came out of the mouth of a man born with at least 17 silver spoons in his mouth i found it i found it deeply deeply disturbing that 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 moment and yet of course given what ellen has just said you know his ability to talk his way out of a wet paper bag his ability to um cosplay victorian mill owner and um and, and and kind of turn it into some sort which again i would say and i don't know him uh, any more than you do but i would say that probably the kind of attention that he got at eton helped to create this ludicrous exterior because that can't possibly be real um taking his nanny on on canvassing trips when he was first trying to get into parliament it's almost as if he is defying his bullies by doubling down on what they find ridiculous and and don't laugh but i can muster up a modicum of sympathy for that bit of his background but obviously what he said about grenfell tower for me should have been the end of his career in public life boris johnson um I think elected to promote him after that, didn't he? Didn't he become leader of the house after those comments? I could be wrong on the crew, but, but he's certainly still there. He's still, well, he's still around. Yeah. Um, can we go to Jenny King? Jenny, are you, are you still there? Um, hi, Jenny. Um, you had a, a, a really um, 
penetrating point to make, I think, about QAnon and the way that they kind of co-opt apparently reasonable argu argumentative styles. Sure. I mean, I, I work in a sphere of, of researching polarization and extremism and hate speech and particularly how that's spreading across various different online platforms and, and how, as you say, ideas or certain terminology becomes exploited. And what's interesting to me about QAnon from, from what I've seen and, and we've partnered with Tortoise on some work around QAnon is is that it, it hides behind the semblance of what looks like critical thinking. So one of the biggest tropes and kind of badges of honor within a lot of conspiracist movements is that you are able to become an internet sleuth yourself and that you go and do your research. And quite often when Q followers are challenged on certain aspects of the ideology, things which have been kind of demonstrably proven as false, the immediate response is always, you know, take the red pill, go and do your own research. And to me, you know, that feels like a really dangerous shift because once you pervert the idea of what critical thinking is, all of these people would say that they are doing their own critical thinking. And indeed it's the populace who are the sheeple. They're the ones who are blindly going along with cultural and social norms. Um, and so actually they would say that, that they are um, espousing the values of independent thought and research and analysis far more than the cucks and the libs and those who are willing to blindly accept the status quo because they're not willing to dig below the surface. So, you know, it, it wasn't a question per se, but what I was just commenting on the fact that even the concept of, of critical thinking has become quite perverted now, at least within internet subculture. I wonder, I, I, I wonder if it's new, actually listening to you speak, and I, I've got a question for you when I, when I finish this, this observation, because you could have been describing the protocols of the, of the elders of Zion with, with, with what you just said, actually. So it's, it's the dissemination and the technology that has changed, but probably the fundamental human flaw that finds it, it, it very seductive to think that you, you're in the know and, and everybody else isn't, is, is probably as old as the hills. Do you think that people like me should talk more about QAnon? Um, I think the genie's kind of been let out of the bottle, to be honest. If I'd been, if, if I think if our research organization had been asked and we've done a lot of commentary on, on QAnon, but much earlier is that, you know, you give oxygen to things and well, also- I, I actually don't, personally, I don't believe that it's even the amount that QAnon is being discussed in public. I think it's the tenor of the conversation. I feel like there is very little to be gained by a narrative in the mainstream media, which is already an object of hatred and, um, you know, like the center of the conspiracy theory. If every single article starts with, look at this nut job group of wackos who believe in a satanic cult. I mean, there's just no way to broker any conversation there. And what you do it is push tempt anybody out of that. Right. Of you just push way. people in further into sort of parallel information universes, basically. And I, it, I, I'd, I'd love to learn more about your work. What we've tried to do, what I've tried to do is come at it from the point of view of the people left behind. I think Mariana Springs work on the BBC this week with the son of one of the worst um, I don't know if she's QAnon, but she's certainly uh, um, dangerous when it comes to coronavirus. Uh, and we've tried to speak to the loved ones and ask, what's it like to lose someone? How can you get them back? But you're so right, Jenny, because you find yourself, even against your best intentions, slipping so easily and so seamlessly into the language of nut jobs and the language of, of loonies. And of course, you have to remind yourself that if you were subscribing to this school of thought and you're listening to someone on the radio describe you as a loony and a nut job i'm not sure i'd ever realize this before i listened to you just then that's proving them right isn't it <laughs> oh of course he thinks i'm a loony and a nut job because he's part of the, and the and, yeah crazy crazy I, I i feel i feel even though it's not yet november i feel i'm about to cosplay as scrooge by drawing this <laughs> thinking to close uh which I hate to do because the chat has been full of um, uh, you know, popular demand for this to carry on basically all night, to become a kind of James O'Brien rave. And I, 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 would I would love nothing more than to be metaphorically at the wheels of steel for this, but sadly, <laughs> I, can't, sadly I can't be. It's, it's a project for another night. Perhaps after uh, the yeah, pandemic. Of course, of course these do. days you, you, you can use sandwiches to buy drugs as well, according to that. Yeah, no, so, so, I, so, I, <laughs> so, so I read, yeah, on the on, on, on reliable Twitter accounts. Um, yeah. 
but I'm, I'm sorry not to have got to everyone in the chat. Um, it, it, it's, it's been just uh, terrific to, to see how, how much interesting uh, uh, debate, uh, I think, Thank you. predictably, James's ideas and propositions and candor has, has as ever, brought up. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for, for, for being here tonight. Uh, do take a look at the book, uh, James O'Brien, How Not To Be Wrong. It's, it's, uh, I promise you, you will not be disappointed. It's a great read. And um, we can't whisk James off to the pub um, and uh, take him away, but let's wave goodbye. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, James. I've had a really lovely time. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, everybody. Thanks, James. Cheers.